creator, the Christ, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Have you ever been so mad at something that you've read that you've thrown the book across the room? Brene Brown, a podcaster and a writer that I know many of you follow, regularly describes reading a book, sailing along in it, learning from it, loving it, lapping it up, and then she stumbles on something that makes her pause and reread. Did I read that right? And when this passage in a book really pushes her buttons or challenges the way that she sees the world, she often says, and then I threw the book across the room. From the last part of today's gospel, for all those who have, more will be given and they will have an abundance. But from those who have nothing, even what they have will be taken away. Oh, I have to tell you, this is one of those throw the book across the room moments in scripture for me. We don't wanna hear these words right now, especially from the mouth of Jesus. To those who have, more will be given. And from those who have nothing, even what they have will be taken away. And to make matters worse, the master in this parable says, throw the servant who has nothing into the outer darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. How are we supposed to make sense of this parable? Where is the good news in these words for us this week as we are sick and tired or we know someone who is? Over 33,000 cases of COVID right now in Oakland County and 1,200 deaths and a spike that continues to rise. Where is the good news for those who hunger right now? Yesterday morning at Open Hands Food Pantry, the cars were so backed up in the parking lot that Timmy and the amazing Open Hands volunteers had already served 55 cars with emergency food before the 9.30 opening time. They fed 187 households yesterday, roughly 550 people. That is double our regular numbers. There's so much hunger. It's hard not to throw the book across the room when we read, give more to those who have, and to those who have nothing, even what they have will be taken away. Does Jesus really mean this? In the gospel this week, Jesus tells a parable which is a riddle of sorts, about a master. Two of the master servants take what is entrusted to them. One is given five talents, the other is given two talents, and these two double the money, and they get praised for it. Okay, but there's some questions that this puzzle raises, and they're troubling ones. First, what is a talent? A talent was a measure a weight made of gold or silver. One talent was the equivalent of 20 years wages for a common laborer. So five talents is worth 100 years of pay. That's two or three lifetimes of someone's accumulated pay. That's a lot of money. And this raises another troubling question. Why would the master who is already a billionaire in today's standards, need to send these two servants out to make him millions more. And notice that the master doesn't tell them how to make the money, what set of ethics or principles to use or rules to follow, something that would have been really important for a righteous master to do in a culture that ran rampant with extortion and usury and tax abuse that the Romans used to bankrupt and dislocate thousands of people. We don't know how these guys made the money. It just said they traded and no one asks and they don't tell, but they made it and they got rewarded for it. Are we reading this right? Can Jesus really mean that we should do this? That this should be our goal? 
not the parable that I wanted to read this week, when someone very dear to me, my sister-in-law, wanted to buy a home that she and her spouse have worked really hard for and saved for, but they weren't quite there. So they went to a lender and the guy says, oh, we've got you covered. You'll just carry a mortgage for a couple of weeks, no problem. We're talking about a simple bridge loan and a few bank fees, win-win. And so she sat down to sign the papers, but then she looked at them closely and noticed that the terms for the bridge loan, those few bank fees, translated to $8,000, $500 per day due in 16 days. No problem. Are you kidding me? Now, was the guy in this story, her lender doing something illegal? No. And in his boss's eyes, his company's eyes, he was doing a good thing, meeting his goals, doubling down, turning a profit, probably earning a bonus and getting rewarded for it. Well done, good and trustworthy servant. My sister-in-law took a pause and questioned the math and tore up the papers and went home. But too many people around us lose their life savings or their business or their job or their civil rights or their treatments. Fill in the blank. They're just trusting a guy who's doing what he's asked and getting rewarded for it. And these deals aren't just made in financial institutions, they're brokered and traded every day in the form of policies and decisions made about education and healthcare, incarceration and civil rights and land use. The decisions that are made in corporate boardrooms and in courtrooms and in city halls and capitals of states and nations in choosing who gets resources and who doesn't, who wins and who loses. To those who have more, more will be given. And from those who have nothing, even what they have will be taken away. And the ones who have nothing are thrown into outer darkness where there's weeping and gnashing of teeth. Does our Lord really mean for us to live this way? Folks, I think this parable turns us inside out and makes us scratch our heads and throw the book across the room because it's meant to. Remember Jesus, his central teaching was blessed are the poor and the meek, those who mourn, those who are persecuted, those who make peace. And our Lord teaches us that the first, the strong and the powerful will be last. And the last will be first. His whole life, his whole message to love and serve our neighbors as ourselves was consistent, even when they killed him for it. So what does Jesus really mean? I don't think in this parable he's telling us how to behave. I think he's telling us how the world works and that we don't have to accept it, to consent to it, to live this way. You see, there are lots of ways to read a parable. And there's a lot here that suggests that the righteous one in this parable is not the master or the two good and trustworthy servants. The righteous one in this parable is the third servant, the one who reads the fine print and questions the math and tells the truth. The one who says, Master, I know that you are a harsh man, reaping what you did not work for and gathering in for yourself what you did not plan or earn. And yes, sometimes I am afraid of you. And here I see her, this third servant, tearing up the contract and pushing away from the table and handing back the money and saying, here, you have what is yours. But I'm not going to play your game or earn more for you. I'm not going to live that way. I just won't. This parable may just be telling us that it's better to be a loser 
an outcast, a whistleblower, a troublemaker, and to forfeit our integrity for our souls. To those who have more, more will be given. And from those who have nothing, even what they have will be taken away. No. Now the ark of scripture, the whole ark of scripture says that God will scatter the proud in their conceit and cast down the mighty from their thrones and lift up the lowly, that God will feed the hungry with good things and send the rich away empty, and that God will wipe away every tear from every eye. So let's go on and do justice and love mercy and walk humbly with our God. Let's choose the third way, even if we lose everything. Jesus did. He eventually forfeited his life, but he also came back from the dead to show us that justice always overcomes and that truth and mercy always prevail and that love always wins. Amen. Amen.